10 minutes, so let me be quick. Uh, I want to begin by thanking everybody that came out tonight. Uh, this is a great turnout. It's in people like us in philosophy and in religion sometimes feel a little out of place, like there aren't other people interested in these abstract and uh, um, difficult questions. So it's, it's, it feels good to have this kind of turnout. I want to thank uh, Columbia Faith in Action, uh, Jesse Peterson, Naomi, I just don't know what she is. Thank you, Naomi. Uh, the Columbia Humanist Society, thank you very much. Uh, and I would also like to thank my lovely girlfriend, Tia. She's sitting right here, <laughs> blushing. But uh, to the point at hand, I do not think that God is necessary for morality in this philosophical sense of the term. That is, as that which grounds morality, that which makes uh, 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 makes morality robust and true and genuine. I am an atheist. I don't think God exists. So it wouldn't make any sense for me to think God is needed for any, any explanation whatsoever. So, as the famous scientist Laplace said to Napoleon when asked about the starry heavens and God, Laplace responds by saying, I have no need of that hypothesis. That is, it doesn't help me in any way explain the way things are the way they are. All it does is add something to the equation. Um, so, it could, we could take for granted, for instance, tonight, we could take for granted that there are objective moral facts. That can be debated, and, but that, that's not exactly what we're debating right now, though. We're debating, is God necessary for there to be morality? If we want to define morality as having moral facts, then fine, let's just do that. But let's say we have a moral fact. The moral fact that is that Auschwitz, looking back, was truly evil and wrong and immoral. Let's just take that for granted. I don't understand in any way, shape, or form how God helps ground that claim at all. It, it, it makes no uh, difference in the explanation, and it doesn't help us get to the deeper questions of where morality arises from uh, in humans through sentiments, uh, as you, you mentioned Hume, um, or if we want to take Kant's uh, deontological approach or utilitarian approach. I'm not necessarily uh, involved in one of these camps over the other, but what I do know is that God is certainly not necessary to explain morality or any other fact. Now, if we want God to help explain um, or ground morality, then it would also be understandable to say God grounds, this God grounds everything, every fact whatsoever. And not just the fact that Auschwitz was wrong, but the fact that 2 plus 2 equals 4. To me, 2 plus 2 equaling 4 is self-evident. That It's uh, axiomatic. It's, 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 it's a given. It holds in all possible worlds. There's no world we can conceive of where 2 plus 2 equals 5. And if we do conceive of one, we think that that world has it wrong. Uh, so we would have to extend God as a grounding explanation for not just moral facts, but all facts. And I do not need that. I, I don't feel that that um, is necessary. Now a joke. Yes, I can tell a joke. <laughs> it's actually completely stolen, too, so I guess I can't tell a joke, but I'll try. This is from Theo Schick. Uh, so, Moses comes down from the mountain, from Mount Sinai, with the tablets, and um, he tells the Israelites, I got good news and I got bad news. And the Israelites go, well, what's the good news? And Moses says, well, God got it down to ten now. Like, okay, all right. And they go, so what's the bad news? And he says, well, God kept the one about adultery in there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the idea that we would need a God, a supreme leader, a supreme cosmic authority to ground morality or any other thing sounds rather uh, overwhelming, to say the least. We discover these things. We progress. We have social contracts. We have ways of dealing with each other through empathy, through sympathy. Uh, 
uh, we, we have also innate within us a desire to survive and to thrive. And my desiring and thriving is intricately tied up to your surviving and thriving. So I think that's really where ethics and morality come from, and there's no need for any other explanation. Now, when God is used as an explanation, it's just like tacking it on at the end. Why is it that we have these moral facts, and it seems as if these moral facts correspond to reality? Uh, and we go, we're asking too large of a question. We're asking why. It's, it, these why questions are uh, kind of set up almost it, to, to act as if they're deep and thorough, thoroughly philosophical questions. But a why question is, to me, this, the, those don't make sense, really. Why? And the, the closest ex answer to any why, why is there existence? Why is there, do we experience meaning? Why are there moral facts or whatever? Uh, I would equally say the answer to that is 42. Um, reference to Douglas Adams' Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. This is serious nerdishness right here. But to me, 42 and God make no difference in the explanation. There's nothing that help. It doesn't help us. Uh, why God? Why God? Why God? It doesn't. Um, and then you can actually flip it. Well, like why? Why use God then? It, it doesn't. It doesn't help in any way in an explanation. When God is invoked in these debates, there's a famous and historical argument, the Euthyphro Dilemma, that a lot of us probably know about from Plato. And this Euthyphro Dilemma uh, posits a, brings up a big problem for God. That is, God either does things because they are good, like there's some outside standard that God appeals to and goes, okay, this is good, let me will it. Or, things are good because God wills it. So if God willed it that murder was good, it would be good. That's this voluntarism uh, problem. And what happens then is that morality is completely arbitrary. If God wills, if whatever God wills is good, then morality is arbitrary, because God could will one way or another. If God could not, then God is stuck or held to a higher standard than God's self. I don't want to say himself, because another problem, I think, with this whole God talk, is we have no idea what we're talking about. To me, God is, saying God is like saying we have, I have, invisible, intangible, undetectable tigers in my garden. I don't think you would believe that. And you would say, well, you know, someone would ask me, well, prove it. And I go, well, I can't. They're undetectable. They're invisible. They're, but they're there. There's tigers there. I don't think any of you guys would believe in my invisible tigers. But uh, so it doesn't, it really genuinely doesn't help when we invoke God in this. Any of the words that we use to describe God, good, him, her, these are human words. And if God is this God we think God is, then God is infinite. God is infinitely transcendent, which means that no human words would be able to be applied to this God. The best thing you could do is remain in silence, or, or maybe Om. But maybe Om would be going a little too far in describing God, because God would transcend any words or any denotations about God. God would actually transcend your idea of God, as Kant, Kant probably points out. So, if we do invoke God, we need to describe this God, and when we describe this God, we use human language that can't be applied to this God, because this God is beyond human language. So, that's another problem with God in general, not just as the basis, or supposed basis, of morality. And, so I think that it's pretty clear that we don't need God to ground morality. I think that morality arises within us, um, there can be objective moral facts without God, just like there can be any facts without God. There can be 2 plus 2 equaling 4 being a fact that doesn't need a ground um, or, or some sort of you know, way to justify it. I think I'm probably good, so thank you very much. Well, uh, 
good evening. I'd like to thank the students here at Columbia University for arranging this debate and Kyle for um, taking up the atheist position tonight. Um, there are several periods in history when worldviews changed radically over a short time, and I think we're living right in the middle of one of these rapid shifts. But since our worldviews can have such a, uh, an important effect on many areas of life, it's always good to consider the implications of uh, various positions. Now, as far as I can tell, uh, the debate tonight is not about whether atheism is true or whether theism is true. It's uh, about a much narrower topic, namely uh, whether uh, things like moral values and uh, objective moral duties and moral responsibility for our actions, whether these things can make sense on a truly atheistic worldview. Uh, when you remove God from your picture of reality, have you also, whether you know it or not, just removed objective moral values, moral duties, and moral responsibility for our actions? I say, you have, Kyle says, you have it. So we have a disagreement, and the question is, who right? Who's right? Not surprisingly, I think I am. <laughs> Here are my opening statements. I'm going to focus on explaining why I came to the view that I have, why I uh, became convinced that, um, that if God does not exist, we don't have those sorts, of, uh, those sorts of things, the things that are presupposed in our discussions of morality. Um, then later, in my rebuttals, I'll flesh out any arguments I need to flesh out and respond to Kyle's arguments. Um, I've never actually been able to understand why atheists would want to defend objective moral values. Uh, those are values that would be true whether we agree with them or not. If every human being in the world rejected them, they would, they would, these things would, these certain statements, certain moral statements would still be true. Um, I concluded that if God does not exist, all is permissible long before I ever believed in God, and I did not see that as a weakness for atheism. Um, as I, at, at first, when I considered my place in the universe, atheism was kind of depressing, but uh, later on, as I explored atheism further, uh, it became much more exciting, and I would say, Liberating. I know I'm not sounding like a Christian right now, but uh, that's just the way things work. Um, so, let me start with the depressing part. It's how I view the universe and our place in the universe, the human situation, uh, when I was a few years younger than most of you in here. We've got this massive universe, and over here there's this little collection of debris, floating debris, that we call the Milky Way. And out on one of the spiral arms of this Milky Way is this hot little ball of gas, we call the sun. And circling this hot ball of gas is a little pathetic speck of dust we call Earth. And on the surface of this little speck of dust are these little lumps of cells called human beings who are only here because their ancestors managed to transmit DNA better than other lumps of cells. And these little lumps of cells are now convinced that they have incredible worth and dignity, that what they do really, really matters, and that their value, so precious to them, uh, are something more than whatever it was that helped their ancestors pass on their DNA, or something indoctrinated into them by society. Everything we do is the result of brain processes and chemical reactions in our brains, but our brains are made of particles, and particles are governed by laws of nature. And if our brains are governed by laws of nature, that means everything we do, everything we think, was determined long before we ever we were ever born. How can we think of ourselves as morally responsible if that's how we view the world? So that was the depressing part, thinking about my position in the universe. Um, but things didn't stop there, and one day I had an epiphany. 
My friend and I, uh, 17 years old, we broke into a store in the middle of the night and we loaded up our backpacks and uh, a little later we were running down some railroad tracks from police. And they kind of had us cornered. There were cops in front of us, cops behind us, cops coming down the hill beside us that left as our only escape route, the Monongahela River, which I'd always been told not to swim because I'll drown. So we dove in, and <laughs> my friend was kind of stupid. He swam straight across, and police were waiting for him. It's a big river, so police were waiting for him when he, when he got over there. Uh, I swam at an angle upstream in the dark because I knew the area was uh, more difficult for police to get to. So I got to the other side and realized that I had outwitted police yet again and started making my way up the hill, which took a while. Um, but eventually, I, made, I got up, uh, I, I emerged from the wooded area and found myself in someone's backyard. And in front of me was a magnificent garden. And I had to get past, past the garden. So I started to walk around. And as I started to walk around, I paused to philosophize. <laughs> and I thought to myself, why am I walking around this garden? I don't care about the people in that house, let alone about their vegetables. So why am I going out of my way to avoid stepping on their cucumbers? What are they going to do? Call the police who just had me cornered and I got away? What are they going to do? And as I stomped my way through that garden, I had this incredible rush of freedom. We spend a lot of our lives thinking what we're told to think and doing what we're told to do, and then one day you sit back and realize, I don't have to do any of that, and they can't make me. But David, we can, we can throw you in jail or something. Really? You got books in there? I'd like to read. But if you do something really bad, we can kill you. Well, here's the secret. I'm going to die anyway. Once you finally grasp that, that if the world cannot hurt you, it cannot control you. It's this amazing sense of liberation, not scared of anything uh, anymore. Credible sense of freedom, I call that the false freedom now, because uh, once you liberate yourself from all external constraints, all you've got to go on is whatever's inside of you, whatever inclinations and desires you have, and living like that gets old after a while. So, um, atheists have a kind of freedom which is tremendously spectacular, but I think it's the best you've got on atheism. And now Kyle wants to steal it from you. You have to, atheists have to follow the exact same rules that everyone else has to follow. Don't let Kyle steal your freedom. Now, I understand that many atheists want to cling to objective moral values, even when I don't see anywhere that these values could be uh, located other than our opinions, and that certainly wouldn't be uh, any kind of objective morality. Um, but there's a problem of consistency here. The problem of consistency is called the skeptic's dilemma. And it goes something like this. Theists have dozens of arguments for the existence of God. Atheists reject those arguments. But on what consistent basis can you reject all of these arguments for the existence of God? and then turn to arguments for the existence of objective moral values and accept those arguments. Say, those arguments are good. In other words, it, it, it kind of looks like this to me. We have what we'll call a skeptometer. Human beings have a skeptometer. It's, it's what controls our level of skepticism, right? And we turn to arguments for the existence of God, and we don't want to believe in God, so we set our skeptometers really high so that all of those arguments fail. But then we turn to morality, which we don't want to reject. And so we set our skeptometers very low, so that any argument for objective moral values will then uh, pass. And so the question is, uh, is, that, is that a good methodology? If you're changing your methodology, depending on what you'd really like to believe, is that a good uh, methodology? I would say no. So if we want to be consistent, we can either, we can either Keep our skepticism so high that all arguments for the existence of God would fail. But then we should retain that same level of skepticism, and we'd have to reject any idea of objective moral values. Or, if we want to believe in objective moral values, we have to lower our skepticism a little so those arguments are successful. But we should keep that same level of skepticism 
when we turn to the existence of God, and there are dozens of arguments that would pass that standard. So we either reject both or we accept both. Either way, but you don't have objective moral values without God. So you've heard opening remarks from both sides, and now each debater has seven minutes to present a follow-up. All right, well, thank you very much for that. I like your term, skeptometer. Uh, my skeptometer is very high, um, and I, I think it should be for, for all of us. And I also don't think that God can be equated or actually brought anywhere near morality whatsoever. Um, there's a difference between morality and God. One being that I, in some sense, experience morality. If, if you can experience God, please let me know and tell me exactly what it's like, how it feels. Let's put you up on some, uh, let's put you in an uh, MRI or CAT scan. Let's you know, put stuff on your brain and see what happens. But you can't actually, as Kant points out, rightly, experience God. So what we're talking about apples and oranges if we're talking about God over here, this intangible, invisible, undetectable force and morality, which all of us in this room experience. Right? So that those can't be put together. Um, the stealing my freedom part, I didn't really get too much. Um, I don't want to steal anybody's freedom. Uh, but, well, may, maybe some people deserve to have their, their freedom stolen. I can grant you that. But I'm certainly not trying to steal anyone's freedom. Now, this atheism that you refer to, I am not very familiar with. Um, and I'm quite familiar with atheism. This, this uh, atheists and other people, non-religious people, people who have a different conception of God, pantheists, or whoever, they live their lives uh, in perfectly meaningful and moral ways. Not everything is permissible. It's not permissible, not because there's a cosmic judge watching me. It's not permissible because it inflicts harm, because it causes undue pain, because it causes suffering, because I'm a human being with emotions, and I care about your suffering. That's why it matters. It doesn't matter because uh, Big Brother is watching me. If I only do things out of fear of this uh, cosmic judge, then my intentions are pretty bad. So it's like uh, the problem with deontological ethics. I go to Tia and uh, I hand her some flowers. She goes, oh, that's so sweet. Why did you... Sorry, that's not how she really sounds, but... <laughs> oh, it's just so, that's so sweet. Why did you get me these flowers? And I go, it was my duty as your boyfriend. What do you think the reaction would be? <laughs> exactly. So morality to me has nothing to do with duty. I would respond by saying, I give you the flowers because I love you. Because I have an emotional connection with you. And because the sex is good. <laughs> that was, sorry, I have to at least uh, make a parody of myself as an atheist, right? Well, um, this just is not the case that atheists are these are these people that believe, hey, we don't have to worry. Things are, you know, let's stomp on as many lettuce and, 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 and cucumbers as we want. It turns out that some of the safest, most democratic, with best health care, with best education, these countries are generally atheistic. The Nordic countries, Denmark, Sweden, lowest rates of crime. These people don't believe in God at all. So it does not follow that you need to believe in God or to have God as ground in morality to act morally. In fact, I think you can make a negative correlation with believing in God and acting immorally. Uh, that has to do with if I have this view of God that he'll forgive me once I repent, then I can just kill somebody, feel guilty about it for a little bit, repent, and then I'm good. Then I move on. See, God is kind of a way of getting out of things. He's kind of an excuse. Also, 
you'll notice that God is always exempted from these own these rules that we discuss. God is always the uh, one to whom things do not apply. Right? Okay? So we would say it's wrong to murder an innocent person. But is it wrong for God to murder an innocent person? And I know this isn't a debate about the biblical text, but if I start pulling that out, uh, let's see, God kills a couple thousand people throughout the text, Satan kills two. I don't know which one of these deities is better than the other, but certainly Satan looks a lot better. He's killed less people. Um, so, besides that, we do not need this, this God. Oh yeah, sorry, real quick. The exception, exception, exception to the rule. So you often hear people say, you know, um, out of nothing, nothing comes. You, you can't have, you can't get something from nothing. Well, but God apparently can't do that. Create something out of nothing. <coughs> so we're willing to grant God the most horrific deeds, the most illogical and unjust actions and behaviors that we're not going to grant to our fellow creatures or fellow people. So that's a problem. That's not exempt God. Um, all things are not permissible. Uh, I would say they were permissible if God existed. If God is this ultimate uh, forgiver, unless unless God is this cosmic, uh, he, unless God just wants people to sin and go to hell, um, God could have this bounty of forgiveness. I could do as many evil things as I want, and God will just wipe them. So that is an excuse to act immorally. In fact, some of the best excuses to act immorally is in the name of this God, or in the name of God. There's some of the best reasons, because God will forgive you. Um, now, I don't know where I'm at, probably five minutes. I'm at seven? 20 seconds. <laughs> 20 seconds, lovely. Um, and you talk about laws of nature, governing our thoughts, and... Uh, uh, we got to distinguish govern. Okay, these they don't govern. They're uh, they they are an arbiter, not a governor. So we determine good and and bad, uh, wrong and right. It, it's not some governing law. It's actually what how we deliberate and decide between actions, intentions, and consequences. So that's my response. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kyle. Uh, Kyle made a comment about sex. Um, I just want to say, for the record, I have more sex than all you atheists put together. <laughs> Are you married? <laughs> Ask my wife. <laughs> all right. Um, <laughs> Kyle says that he sets his skeptometer high. Uh, yeah, with certain things like the existence of God, but not with uh, things like objective moral values. He says, well, he has, uh, he experiences morality, but not God. Um, let, let me just ask a, a quick question here. How many of you would say you have some experience of God? Okay, so looks like about half the room. That's, but you must all be delusional, right? Now here's the key. Many of you would say, most, maybe all, that you have an experience of morality. Why can't that be delusional, right? I mean, we're talking about a, a good portion of the people in here saying that they can experience God. Well, what do you mean when we say we experience morality? We mean we have some sort of feeling that certain things are wrong or certain things are right. Well, that's not experiencing objective moral values. That's not experiencing responsibility for actions. The, the difference is some things can be uh, illusory. Some, we can be mistaken about things. When, when I go outside, I see the sun moving across the sky. Uh, I, I feel like I'm stationary, and it's the sun that's moving. That's wrong. Our experience can be wrong. And that's the position of many philosophers when it comes to ethics. It is, yes, we, we, we feel a certain way, but that has nothing to do with objective moral values. So how do you experience objective moral values? How do you experience such a thing? Do you, you find it with a, with a microscope or telescope? What? How do you, how, where is the experience of this? Um, uh, he says that atheists and, and many others live by the same values and you know we should avoid things because they harm people, not because 
God says so. And uh, just for the record here, uh, the, the debate tonight is, we're, I'm, I'm not saying atheists can't be moral. An atheist could be the nicest person in the world, the most generous person in the world. An atheist could go out right now and do all of the same things that Mother Teresa did. But you can also go live like a frog, right? Everyone in this room could hop on over to a pond, plop down on a lily pad, and he flies all day. We could do it. It can be done. That's not the point. The point is, should you do it? Do you have a moral obligation to live like a frog? No. Do you have a moral obligation to do good things? Well, that's, that's the entire question. Uh, I don't see how on atheism you would have a moral obligation to live this way rather than that way. Even the, the bare rule, which is sort of, sort of the, you know, the, the, the lowest common denominator here, don't harm other people. <coughs> Why? Give, give, me a reason, give me a reason not to harm someone consistent with atheism. I'll give you an example. Jeffrey Dahmer. Remember him? It's a little before your time. Killed and ate 17 people. Why should he not do that? We kill and eat cows. Why not kill and eat people? You have to have some sort of moral standard where you just say, because there's this rule. There's this rule. And what's the status of that rule? Well, if you're an atheist, you kind of only have a couple of, a couple of places to go. You can either say that it's, uh, it's hardwired into us. And if it's hardwired into us, that's not really objective morality because you can be hardwired uh, for all kinds of things. Right? There, 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 are, there are men who grow up and they're just attracted to little boys. That's what they're attracted to. Uh, would we say that that's okay? No, of course not. We would say it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what you feel like doing. It doesn't matter what your inclination is. It doesn't matter what you have urges for. You don't do that. It's a rule. You don't do that sort of thing. So if it's hardwired into you, don't see how that could be a source of objective moral values. Or if you say that society teaches these things and we pass them down, uh, how is that objective? Because different societies teach different things. You can go to different societies around the world right now and find some very some things that would startle you. Who's more right? So if you're, a, if you're a, a young woman, you're wearing a skirt right now. There are cultures where if you walk outside in a skirt, your own family would kill you for bringing shame on the family. Uh, they think that's right. We think that's wrong. Who's right here? Well, Kyle would say, well, it's, it's wrong to harm other people. Well, not in all cases. Certainly, there are situations where we would harm someone, horrible criminals and so on, and these people happen to believe that people who really are going to cause problems in society would uh, need this sort of punishment. And who's right and who's wrong? Well, on atheism, I just don't see uh, any way to distinguish uh, some one moral value from uh, another, when we have differences of opinion. Um, Kyle says, if we only do things out of fear of God, then it's not really good. I actually agree. Um, I don't obey God because I'm afraid he might zap me. Uh, I obey God because uh, there is a right. It means that if God exists, if I'm created, then we have sort of a top-down picture of the universe where a source of perfect goodness creates the world. And if that's the case, well, I certainly have certain moral obligations. And so there is a right and there is a wrong. And I do the right because I love God, not because I'm afraid of getting uh, struck by lightning or something. Uh, he says, atheists don't stomp on, uh, you know, don't need to go out and, and stomp on people's vegetables, and we don't need God to act morally. Well, that's true. And no, again, no one's saying you need God in order to act morally. The point is, when you say, so-and-so ought to do something, what do you mean? What do you mean when you say, you should not torture that old lady? Do you just mean you're, you're just giving your opinion? Or do you mean you've got this moral value, you do not harm people? Well, where, again, where are you getting that from? You didn't get that from nature, because nature harms, nature harms all kinds of things. So you didn't get that from nature. Where are you getting that from? And what we find is people just lay this down as a rule. There's a rule, no harming people. Well, if you're going to do that, you can lay down any rule, right? If I'm just going to stomp my foot and say, this is the rule, and this is a rule that must not be violated. Why can't you make any rule? Don't wear green. It's a rule. Foundation morality, right? Why not? If we're just going to lay it down. I'm asking, why is that wrong? Again, can't get it from being hardwired. If it's society, then there are certain, certainly cultures around the world uh, and down through history that would love to harm people and who did harm people. And why were they wrong for that? At the end of the day, I haven't had any sort of justification for why this would be objective. What Kyle has said is, this is a moral value. Okay, I, I agree it's a moral value. I agree it's a true moral value. 
But I don't see how that sort of thing can be true on atheism. <coughs> So we're almost finished. Into the third round of remarks, we have five minutes of conclusion by your speaker, and then we'll open up for Q and A. All right, five minutes. Here we go. You brought up Mother Teresa. I certainly wouldn't keep her or esteem her as a saint um, when she kept people and promoted a type of poverty that led to the impoverishment and death of so many people when that could have been taken to hospitals fifty, hundred miles away. She herself got her health care in Southern California. So, uh, she's not a saint to me. Amen. <laughs> There's like, that's like, that makes three of us in the world. <laughs> but, um, moral obligation, that was brought up again. And I, I thought I kind of already illustrated why the problem, there's a problem with the obligation thing, the girlfriend scenario. As, well now I have a new argument, it's called the girlfriend scenario. But, <laughs> that, I mean, you don't, Okay, God, I'm going to do this for you because I'm obliged to do so is not the same thing as where you ended saying, I want to because I love God. I don't see love and obligation as uh, things that go hand in hand. In fact, they're not. Love is something that, as far as I'm concerned, ought to be freely given, non-compulsory, not coerced, not forced with fear or intimidation. It should be something freely given um, and freely chosen. Now you notice uh, there's this idea in what David says that um, where, where, where does morality come from? Where do these moral values come from? Uh, that is equivalent to a kind of why question that I think is it, it asks way too much. Why? Where is morality? Well, where is God? Well, where is the world from? If anybody tries to tell you that they can answer those questions, doubt them, please. Because they're saying that they know the kind of <laughs> ultimate nature of things. I know where morality is from. I know where the world is from. Those are not humble statements. Those are extremely, extremely high statements that demand very high levels of justification that aren't given. So the question of where does morality come from, it's, it's, I don't think that's actually a good question. We won't get anywhere when we ask that question. Just like we won't get anywhere when we ask where does the world come from? Or where, I mean, where does God come from? So I, so the, those where does where's morality come from and why is it this way, etc.? These questions don't help us at all. Um, you also said something interesting. You said, you know, how is it, you know, people coming up with this cultural, culturally constructed, societally determined understanding of morality and the social contract and what constitutes right and wrong in different cultures having different measurements for that, etc. But the funny thing that you said there is you said they have that as opposed to if God said it. Now the key word there, when he, when he said God said it, is said it. How, does God have vocal cords? Does God have lips or a tongue? If he doesn't, we can't say God said anything. Said is a human word. Uh, said cannot be applied to an infinite being if there was one. There, unless... This God had infinite vocal cords, an infinite mouth, and an infinite tongue. And all these things don't make any sense. They, to me, they don't make any sense. So we got to be careful with the language that we use. When God said, I mean, that's, that's going too far in our epistemology to presume that not only do we know where the world comes from, where morality comes from, but that God can speak. Uh, we, we're only at five minutes, right? Yeah, you got 45 seconds. Okay. Wow, I, that, was, that was pretty good. Internal clock. Um, so, in conclusion here, God is not necessary for explaining or grounding morality. These are things that we continually work on. We try to better ourselves. We try to better society. 
We don't have all these answers. I'm willing to go, where did the world come from? I don't know. I'm fine with that. But if I gave you an answer to the most fundamental question we could ask, then there is a problem. I mean, if I had the answer to reality, me, a 29-year-old walking around on a pale blue dot, has the answer to where morality comes from, don't believe me. Um, and that's my conclusion. Kyle said your Mother Teresa was bad. I'm not going to object, I'm just going to say on what atheist standard was Mother Teresa bad because she kept certain people from going to get health care where they might have gotten. Why on earth is that bad? Think about it. In a state of nature, sick organisms don't make it. And that means they don't pass on the genes that allowed them to uh, that made them more susceptible to diseases and so on. Uh, it means they don't pass on their genetic material. And more fit organisms do. Well, now it's become we need to give sick people health care. Someone is born with horrible diseases and, and is, is horribly disabled. We need to give them health care so they continue. Really? Well, that's the opposite. That's the opposite of the way things work in nature. So where did we get that? Where, that's what I'm asking. Where did that sort of thing come from, that compassion trumps how natural selection works? And I agree that it does. But I don't know where you're getting that from on an atheistic worldview. He says that love and obligation are not the same thing. Love is freely given and so on. I'm not saying I'm going to do good so that God loves me. I'm saying I'm going to do the right thing, not out of fear, but because, one, as I pointed out, there is a right, there is a standard of right and wrong, and two, also because I love God. And most people would agree, if you love someone, that sort of inclines you to have certain moral obligations to them. If you love your wife or your husband, you want to do certain things for the one you love. I don't see any uh, inconsistency there. Um, Kyle thinks that sort of ultimate why questions are bad. It requires knowledge of ultimate reality. And on this issue of morality, that's not the problem. If God exists, we know where morality comes from, right? There's no mystery. If God exists, we might wonder how it works and so on. But if God exists, we know where morality comes from. Morality comes from God. The problem that I see from the atheist for the atheist position is that if God does not exist. If the natural world is all that exists, we still we know where morality comes from, right? If, if, if naturalism is true, you only have a couple of, of, of places to go for explanations. You've got what? You've got matter, energy, space, time, and natural laws. So the only place you can go to sort of explain morality would be in some sort of collection, some sort of combination, namely that once particles come together in a certain pattern, that's sophisticated and complex enough, suddenly objective moral values come into existence like do not harm others and give, you know, be compassionate towards people and give them good health care. Um, what's the status though? I mean, what's the status of those moral values? With a bunch of particles and they come together and they get complex. How is that something that anyone would be moral, morally obligated to do? If, in other words, if someone had their particles in a totally different pattern and it said run around killing, how is one more right or more wrong than the other? If, if, if people coming together in a certain way, that is your objective moral value, well then, if people came together in a different way, why wouldn't that be an objective moral value, even if it was you know, some sort of uh, horrendous practice? The point is, we, there, there's some standard beyond all of this that allows us to say, if that were the case, even if it were you know, particles in motion and so on, and it developed that way, that would be right, and this other thing would be wrong. What's the standard? You don't have it on atheism because you don't have anything beyond that pattern of or that pattern of collection of molecules. Um, Kyle says that God said it doesn't make sense. Uh, if we're talking about an all-powerful being, uh, I think God could say whatever he wants. That's God, by definition, can do that sort of thing. Now, uh, I only have about a minute left, so uh, just think about this. When we say, when we're talking about morality, when we tell people you ought to do this or you ought to do that, we're presupposing several things. We're presupposing that there are objective moral values, that there is a good and that there is a bad. 
we're presupposing that there are moral duties, that there are certain things you ought to do and other things you ought not to do. And we're presupposing that we are responsible for our actions. We blame people for doing wrong and we praise people for doing right. None of that really makes sense on the, on the atheistic view. What you can say is, human beings emerged and this is the way we've done things for a long time, and so uh, we have these values and so on. I agree, but on your picture of the world, uh, that's not what we mean by morality. 